Yes. Yep. All good. Yes, okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. But um, my first time in South America. It's, yesterday's presentations were so interesting from my point of view to see what you're all doing and uh, and how uh, fantastic a job you're all doing uh, in your various Met agencies in South America. I'm an operational forecaster. I've spent just about my whole career as in working in offices just like yours. Uh, I worked in Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, I've spent most of my career focusing on severe weather forecasting. And three years ago, we had an opportunity to start at what we called the Extreme Weather Desk, where we would bring a section out of the ground where we'd focus on severe weather that had some kind of impact anywhere in the country on any given day. So instead of just being in one state of my country where severe weather comes and goes less frequently, on any given day we're focusing on where the impact weather is. We've got three main focuses, science to operations and operations to science. We do a huge amount of frontline communication work, so severe weather videos, television, media, etc. And we also have what we call a top cover role, where we're there for our colleagues in our state and territories when things get busy. When, it, when they're under the pump, we're there to help them. And what I'll be presenting today is what we've developed under two of those streams, the first one being top cover and the second being science to operations. How have we done that? We've developed what we call a national hazard outlook and the main concept being trying to show as many hazards as possible for our whole country for seven days on one A4 sheet of paper. It's a challenge and uh, I'll be really interested in your feedback on it during the day. In the first half an hour, I'll try and get through the general process with a focus on the data that we all need to think about when we're looking at impact-based forecasting. Uh, then we'll go into a bit more detail about the data before lunch and then this afternoon we'll workshop our process. And that's where you will become the expert because I'll be feeding off your information, your feedback and what you think you would change for your individual agencies. So let's get into it. So what started us was similar issues to what I heard yesterday. We're issuing warnings for strong winds. But what does a strong wind mean? 90 kilometres per hour is our threshold for damaging winds. Uh, if winds gusts exceeded 125 kilometres per hour, we'd talk about destructive winds. How many of the general public understand the difference between damaging winds and destructive winds? Very few. Our emergency services understand it. But what our general public need to know is about the impact. This has been well recognised internationally and as such uh, we've started to move in the direction of focusing more on impact. So just quickly, I'm quite certain that all of you will have been through the WMO guidelines for multi-hazard impact based forecasts and warning services, but I think probably for the next few days we need to all be clear on the definitions. When we talk about a hazard, we're talking about hydrometeorologically based threats, life, property or the environment. A lot of the time I've heard you shortening that to threat to socio-economic activity. And uh, so I might, may shorten to that at times to do exposure. Who and what might be affected? Time and space dependent. Just as is vulnerability. So who's out there threatened by the hazard? And how vulnerable are they to, in terms of their livelihoods, and property. Now the definition of risk, towards the end of today I'll show some other definitions along international standards. The definition in the WMO guidelines, the probability and magnitude of harm attendant on human beings, their livelihoods and assets, assets due to exposure and vulnerability to a hazard. So where the hazard overlaps the vulnerability and the exposure spatially and temporally. 
That's our risk of impact, as defined. Okay, so we started thinking, what can we do in a short amount of time without a huge investment? And we needed to think about what we were already doing in that space, which is why it was so interesting to see what you have all been doing in that space. We have what we call embedded meteorologists. So in each state and territory, we have a forecaster who sits with our emergency management agencies. Sometimes they're every single day of the week, no matter what, and in some states they're just when there's impact weather about. But the State Control Centre in Victoria, I've worked there, I've been one of those embedded METs, and one of my colleagues, Kevin Parkin, developed this product. It's not graphical, but it gives an indication of what a threat might be. In this case, uh, looking at lightning and thunderstorm activity and the potential for that uh, in the first day of that outlook. Just like most of the presentations yesterday, there's various levels of threat there. There's a, uh, like in this case, it's stayed grey, but there's the ability to go through yellow, orange and red. Not too dissimilar to the matrix in the WMO guidelines. And that is, came, I'm quite fairly certain, came straight from the UK Met Office and the work that uh, the UK Met Office has led in this regard. And so, of course, we looked at that uh, deeply. And, of course, then the WMO guidelines, uh, which well aligned with uh, what was happening in the UK Met Office. So a lot of what we've done uh, really leans heavily on that, um, uh, I want to say, groundbreaking work. Uh, I think that th there's been work along those lines, but I think the uh, most Met agencies, international Met agencies, have been looking to the UK for leadership in this regard. Why do we do it? Because we've got a top cover role, but we needed to place national hazard impact and risk assessment at the core of our operations before, during and after events. And when I say our operations, I don't just mean the extreme weather desk, I mean the Bureau of Meteorology. We need to be able to, with the resources that we have, we need to be able to use them the best we possibly can. And the best way we can do that is to focus those resources where the impact weather is. So I'll go through what we do before an event, during an event and after an event, uh, which watching some of the presentations over the last couple of days makes me think that I should probably change this to preparation, recovery and the resourcing during the event. So in that preparation phase, we're issuing a national hazard outlook, and it, not only for the community, but also for our own operations. We realise it's not a large step of work to think about what the impact is likely to be on our operational resources when we're doing these assessments. We use that operational product to structure how we do meetings during the event, how we coordinate our media strategy, the press releases, severe weather videos, and, uh, and how many people we're likely to need, or extra people in different areas of the organisation. And of course, the emergency services become a part of that as well, and they're extremely interested in what we're doing in that space in terms of operational impact and making sure that we align with that, with the Australian Emergency Services. After the event, post-event review management, we had a review about five or six years ago of our post-event review management. And it was OK, but there was a lot of things that we could improve. We, about 18 months ago, PERM, I'll call it quite often today, uh, came into the extreme weather desk, you could say, walked through the door and said, you guys are probably the best people to take this on and provide leadership in it, with it for the organisation. And it was happening at the same time we were thinking about developing a national hazard outlook. It was kind of perfect. 
because the way we were looking at with PERM assessing the impact of an event was perfect to align with the way that we might forecast the impact of an event. So we'll go through more of that too. And the way I thought we'd go through it is with tropical cyclone markets. So this was in March of this year, it hit a capital city called Darwin. It's in the Northern Territory. It's the very Northern frontier of Australia. And it was the strongest tropical cyclone to impact Darwin since tropical cyclone Tracy. Some of you may have heard of, it was back in 1974. It devastated Darwin before Darwin had uh, good building codes or, or stronger building codes. Before the event, when we're thinking about our contingency planning, we produce this graphical product that I was talking about. So it has graphics for one to four days, and we just do a written outlook for five to seven days. We do that with partnerships with our state and territory colleagues who own the forecast policy currently. It also provides a structured and considered record. So during the post-event review or any follow-up report writing, there's lots of people interested in how we forecast particular events. I've heard you all talk about that sort of thing already too. Here's the product. Well, here's the first page of the product. The and this is for tropical cyclone markets. So Darwin is up here. And on this 1A4 page, we have four weather events that we considered could provide, uh, uh, produce some impact. There had been extensive rain through Sorry, I'm struggling with the laser. Extensive rain through Queensland. So riverine flooding. That was something that had happened about a week or so beforehand. There was the potential for, uh, well, very likely potential for severe fire danger down over the southeast of the continent. There was tropical, this tropical cyclone or tropical low at this stage. It hadn't developed into a tropical cyclone. And also heavy rainfall. The tropical coast of Queensland around the Cairns area uh, really copped it last year with, um, with heavy rainfall. So we were looking at that yet again. Now, uh, I haven't got the next couple of pages here, but on the next couple of pages, what we do is focus in on each day and provide some dot points on each event. So these dot points they have information about what the event is, but we try and make these dot points aligned with what the sorts of impacts are that we're expecting. So not winds greater than 90 kilometres per hour, but winds, uh, well, in general, it's not what it says here, but the, in general, we're trying to say things more like winds strong enough to bring down large trees or break large tree branches. So, communicate the impacts rather than the, um, the, the actual cause. Uh, oh, sorry. So this is the next, what happens on the next couple of pages, but below the, um, below the matrix, we have these, these dot points. Now, so for the Friday and the Saturday, you can see C, tropical low or possible cyclone, is rated as High impact, likely. So we're getting pretty confident about the impact at this stage. It's about, we're only 24 hours out. I should have mentioned that this product is issued at 8.30 a.m. for the day, but when we were doing this in a trial run last year, this product was issued the afternoon beforehand. So it's around that 24 hours lead time. This is the operational outlook. Now you can consider that once we've gone through and drawn all those graphical areas, they're kind of already there. But going through and considering what the impact is to the operations is 
not that hard. Additional staff likely required because we're expecting a coastal impact on populated areas. We talk about what the, what the problem is. And it's a traffic light system. Again, well, yellow, orange, red. It was interesting seeing the different colours people use yesterday. But basically everyone's using very similar colours, which is aligned with uh, a lot of our emergency management in Australia. So that's why we chose those colours. We'll talk more about thresholds and things later. But uh, having that operational product, extremely useful for the um, uh, contingency planning leading into an event. Okay. I'm getting used to this thing. The, how do we assess the impact? So this is the, it's difficult for you to read. We've got somewhere printouts of these tables, which I don't need now. <laughs> Thanks, Carolina. But the, we will go through these in intimate detail during today and, and this afternoon. Basically, we go th um, and look at in a structured way, how each event might impact the various uh, vulnerabilities in that region. So if I start with the hazard community impact rubric, because it's a table that provides a score in the end, we'll see how that happens in a second. For life, we've assessed minimal danger to life and few injuries and illnesses. I'll show the way the tropical cyclone was forecast to move a little bit later on. But basically, we weren't expecting it a day out to go across Darwin. Property, widespread damage, building structures, property. We're expecting a category two off the coast. Emergency services, high demand. We're fairly confident about that. Transport, day-to-day -day activities, agriculture, land and vegetation. We can go through this in more detail later on. But basically what we do is we go through and add up the scores for each. So for life, we've got a one. For property, we've got a two. Delivery of services and utility, we've got a two. So one plus two is three, five, seven, nine, 11, still 11, 13. By the time we get to the end of this part of the rubric. Then we consider who's out there, who's exposed, and what the duration is, so the temporal scale of the event. And in this case, a regional city or capital city, Darwin. So we get plus two there. Spatial exposure, we're expecting it to be over quite a wide area. And it's a tropical cyclone, so three to 12 hours. So we had 13, uh, plus two, 15, 16, 17, is the score that the rubric came up with. And we'll talk about how we develop the tiers and the thresholds later on, but that makes it just at the low end of high. Then we consider what else might modify that impact rating. What's the resilience of the community? Have they just been smashed by some other severe weather event in recent times? Or are they well prepared? Uh, in this case, we're thinking well prepared. Is it a holiday, a travel period? Are we expecting more people on the roads? In this case, no. So the score remains at 17, so we're a low end high. Make sense? We'll go, for, we'll go for questions later. We do the same operationally now. So a structured way to consider how our operations will be affected during this event. Our warning services, we're expecting high-end severe weather and multi-hazard populated areas, major flooding. We'll talk about the words uh, a lot during today and I'll be really interested in, in your feedback on those words. Uh, additional staffing required, routine contingency planning arrangements likely to be invoked. Extensive internal briefing activities. We know we're going to be doing press conferences. We're likely standing next to the Premier. And so we're expecting that workload. Uh, and the, the media will be uh, not only large on a 
scale for the Northern Territory office, it'll be large on a scale for Australia. There'll be a lot of national media interest and likely some international media interest is our uh, experience with uh, tropical cyclones like this. So two plus one plus two plus one, six makes it into a high impact for our operations. Now, if you ask me how do you make a decision on a weather forecast, you need four things. You need the forecast. You need to know the certainty in that forecast. You need to know how reliable the forecast is. So I was very happy to hear about the, in Chile, the uh, having your operational meteorologists as part of their duties doing verification of the warning services during the event. You need to know how reliable the product is. That's where the trust and credibility comes. And you also need to know the context of a forecast. So how does it compare to a recent event, something that you remember? Or is it something that's greater than anything's come before? That way you can make your decisions. How do we assess the certainty in our impact forecast? We consider the hazard probability. And I won't go through these words in detail now for time's sake, but we basically do the same things that you all do in your agencies when you're doing your forecasts on a day-to-day -day basis. We consider the guidance that we've got available to us, we consider the ensembles, and we consider is the event something that is currently in our forecast policy, but potentially the new guidance that's coming in is selling us another story? Or is it something that's not yet in our forecast policy, but we're probably already talking to the emergency services because we're quite worried about something that could happen? And most of those scenarios are uh, in this possible area. But for this, we've got the tropical low. We know it's going to develop. It's in a low sheared environment. We've got really... Um, very high sea surface temperatures for it to move into. So for this case, we've got two likely, and how does that affect our matrix that we looked at initially? Looking at the community, we've assessed using our rubric that we've got a high community impact. That's what we're forecasting through this consideration. We think it's likely, given the guidance and the consistency in the guidance. So that's where the high likely came from in the matrix that looks very similar to the matrix that is in the World Met Organisation guidelines. And we can talk more about that a little bit later on too. OK. Now, I mentioned that the state and territory officers own the forecast policy. We don't have a cascading forecast policy in the Australian Weather Bureau yet. It's likely that that's the way that we'll be moving in the not too distant future. So when we produce in the extreme weather desk in the National Operating Centre this product, it has to be consistent with the state and territory officers. There's no question because you issue inconsistent things from the same agency you uh, affect your credibility. So how do we do that? Uh, we have a chat software. Jabber is what we're using at the moment. Um, those of you who are really good with English will be able to read uh, some of the feedback that has come from the different states and territories, the Northern Territories. Uh, Chris Kent has given some uh, good information. Now, this is actually not associated with tropical cyclone markets. This is just something, a screen grab that I grabbed as I was putting this, these slides together. But what we do is we draft the product and issue it to internally to the states and territories at about 5pm. We leave it to the night shift to look at it and provide feedback on it in all the different states and territories and give us um, inf further information about uh, the spatial or temporal details that they might be onto that we haven't considered at a national scale. 
I'll get used to pressing the right button soon, I'm sure. We can also do it graphically. I spoke to someone who's using visual weather. I can't remember who it was. Visual weather, it's, a, it's the tool that we're using in the BOM, Australian Bureau of Meteorology, the BOM, uh, to look at our data. We're not issuing many external products with it yet. The National Hazard Outlook is produced using visual weather, but we have a collaboration tool. And that allows the regional forecasters to modify the areas that we've drawn in a state-by-state -state basis. Not only that, they can do it while we're watching. So, uh, impossible to read, but up the top here, which you can't read, shows the, diff the server that is being, um, is being worked on. And uh, basically, this is the Victorian server, and this is the National Operational Centre server. I can't do this interactively, I wish I could, but when uh, the National Operations Centre person edits this area, in real time, the state-based forecaster can see it moving. So using Jabba, we've got video telephones, which are fantastic as well, and we can share screens. Uh, we're able to collaborate on these areas and ensure the consistency, and then when the extreme weather desk meteorologist turns up to work at 7 o'clock the next morning, it, he or she has an excellent first cut and they've got an hour and a half to pull in any further information, the, um, latest warnings, etc., and check it before they send it, which goes to the Australian Government Crisis Coordination Centre by 8.30 in the morning for their morning 8.45 a.m. briefing. So it can feed directly through channels to the Australian Government about uh, any impact weather for seven days for the continent. OK. We're still talking previously. That was all before. This is all preparation. So now let's think a little bit about during an event. So dependent on how we've assessed the operations, and this level of operations basically came from the State Control Centre in Victoria, uh, the thresholds that they use for their operational activities. We pretty much cut and paste that and then looked at some minor changes to make it work for our agencies. So let's just look at level three, thinking about Tropical Cyclone Marcus. Surge operations, local and or national staff required including both remote and or fly-in surge. So the extreme weather desk, we sent Grace Leg, one of our meteorologists, you'll see her in a second, to Darwin. She worked in the Tropical Cyclone Warning Centre in Darwin through this event, and she is excellent in the media as well. So she did a lot of TV crosses, etc. Routine national contingency planning, executive and government briefings, all this occurred and was likely to occur. Continuous media daily severe weather videos. So we use the impact ratings for structure and resource. So we can maintain agility during the event. Here's Grace. And I've embedded a screenshot of this, one of the severe weather videos that she did during this event. Uh, here's Tropical Cyclone Marcus directly over Darwin at this point, forecast to move back out over the ocean. It actually intensified, move off into the Indian Ocean and became a beautiful Category 5 system. Didn't really affect the Australian coastline other than some big swells and uh, being a surfer, I was extremely interested in that. But the, this is a meeting invite for one of our daily contingency meetings that we trigger when we go into yellow or orange for our operations. Uh, during that contingency meeting, we, we think about the context, the climate context. So that's what I said, one of the four things to make a weather-related decision. Uh, what's our media plans? Get the national media team involved. What videos? 
who's going to do these videos? The extreme weather desk in these situations get pulled in many different directions because we do the frontline communications plus the surge support. Um, social media. What tweets will we be issuing? How are we going to deal with this with Facebook? <laughs> And what key decisions are going to be made? Are we going to do press conferences nationally or make them state-based and similar with media releases and videos? And the centre director for the National Operations Centre was chairing this meeting. So even to how these meetings are chaired, we can structure that. We haven't got it perfect yet, but we're putting together operating procedures for that for this uh, summer, for these warm month scenarios where it will be either uh, myself or the National Operations Centre manager or the manager of National Operations which is one level above or it, our plan is that if we go into red and we're expecting an enterprise response required that we would be bringing in our general executive at least to be a part of the meeting, likely not to chair them. So that was during, it was quite quick about after. So the pace event review. When we first started looking at this in the extreme weather desk, well I should say when my colleagues first started looking at this because I was driving around Australia with my family in a caravan which was pretty awesome at the time but they, uh, they were working extremely hard and had uh, and did some amazing work in this space with the pace event review management. Uh, what type of events? We don't want to write up uh, every single event. We only want to write up the events of interest or have had uh, some decent impact. So high impact events will always do a perma. We find ourselves doing a lot of the moderate events as well because it's useful for verification but it's also of interest for a lot of other scenarios. The, uh, our director has to sit in front of our Senate about once a, every three or four months and answer questions about the weather. And those moderate events written up in the post event review management are extremely useful for that briefing purpose. Any event where there's been a service performance issue, uh, there's been a little discussion about the when things go wrong, things don't always go perfectly right, unfortunately. But luckily, they don't, otherwise we wouldn't have jobs because it would be easy. But um, any event where there's been staff fatigue, you know, have we really worn people out? Have we pushed people beyond the appropriate limits? And have we struggled to provide people, get the people in the appropriate seats that we need? So those sort of events. Other non-hazard related events. Our first post event review management that we did with this, uh, with this new, newly developed perm was actually over Christmas of last year when one of our major services, servers died and we lost all our data across the organisation and coming in towards the end of the year we were late providing all the end of the year climate context as a result. So there was a lot of people having to pull themselves away from their families during that Christmas period and, uh, and, and work and get that server up and running. It had a big impact. The external community, that impact was very low. There might have been a little bit of frustration, something wasn't available, but internally it was fairly major. And so that's worth writing up. Okay, TC Marcus, what happened? This is... Um, where it was about when uh, that forecast was issued, so 1 p.m. Uh, the day before, and forecast to go over the Tiwi Islands, stay away from Darwin, but still produce strong winds and heavy rainfall, and we had a tropical cyclone warning for a fair chunk of the coast. By 10 a.m. on the morning of the 16th, uh, it was becoming clear that it was going further to the east, and the night shift updated the forecast for it to go directly over Darwin. It was an excellent forecast in the end. The night shift really performed. The only thing was the Arafura Sea, extremely hot. It was a low sheared environment. It was perfect for it to develop into a Category 2. 
and it crossed Darwin, or at least went into Darwin as a Category 2. It weakened a bit before it went off um, yeah, back over the, the ocean and, as I said, redeveloped. The impacts. We had 30,000 homes without power in Darwin, fallen trees, widespread damage, uh, some potential for drinking water contamination, so some big impacts. Operational impacts. When we have a tropical cyclone impact one of our state or territory offices, our contingency is for the people in that office to stay there, to stay safe, for the people not in the office who are rostered on to not come to work, to stay at home. So what do you do? You have to move all the operations to one of the other offices. In this case, Perth did the tropical cyclone forecasting for Darwin as the tropical cyclone went over Darwin. Seamless. The, we were working hard in the background, making sure we had enough people in Perth to look after it, but from the community's point of view, they wouldn't know where the forecast came from. But big operational impact. Uh, widespread media interest, severe weather videos, joint press conferences. So, we go through the same process in our post-event review management. We look at the rubric, and you'll notice that for Marcus, there's quite a few that we put in the extreme category when we went and back and looked at what the actual impacts were after the event. <laughs> uh, we got up to 25. So it was still a high impact. Didn't quite get into extreme. But it was high end high. So that's the, there's usefulness in the rubric. We've found ourselves using that such terminology as we've gone through this development process. It's a low end high event, it's a high end high event. Uh, I've, found, I've, I've used similar terminology when talking to colleagues about floods. Is it just going to crack the major flood level or is it going to really start washing away homes? That, I think, is something worth considering uh, through this process as well. Operational impacts. We got into extreme as well with the internal and government liaison. It was a huge amount of work, a huge amount of media. The state manager for Darwin was on holidays. So that in itself increases the operational risk. Todd Smith is uh, an excellent state manager. He's an excellent tropical cyclone forecaster. And he was upset that he wasn't there. He would have loved to have been there. Todd Smith came home to a tree on his house. So he, we had people who worked for us as we were in that recovery mode, in part of the recovery mode that the rest of the city was going through as well. So the operational impacts uh, continue post-event as well. OK, now this is the event impact assessment summary. And so during the PERM process, we pr produced this for uh, every event. And I'll leave this English version here because we've, uh, some hard work went on over the last couple of weeks and I've actually got a Spanish version as well. I'll just give the English people a bit of time to uh, skim read it. But basically it talks about the weather event, the noteworthy observations and records, the community impacts and the impacts on the operations in a nice, neat little package. There's the Spanish version. We produce, we, we take these impact assessment summaries and we put them in one document, one after the other, in order of when they occurred, and we use that for uh, the Senate estimate briefing. So that's what I talked about before when our director of the organisation goes in front of the Senate. So he's able to go through this, skim it, have it there with him. If he gets any questions on it, he can go straight to the source of the information. Very useful. I won't spend too much time on the post-event review management because we're here to talk about impact forecasting and, uh, and this morning session is all about data. I put this up mostly to show that it doesn't end once we've done that assessment. Then we make a decision 
reflecting on whether or not we need to do a structured debrief, pull everyone in, which of course we did for this event, pull everyone in, talk about what we could have done better, what we did really well as well. It needs to all be reported. Uh, and out of that, generally there's some lessons to be learnt, which is great, but they're only good if you actually implement them somehow. So those lessons need to go through a structured process through our policy branch. Do we need to change the service for any reason? Do we need to change the way our operational contingencies worked and make sure that we learn from those lessons and make the appropriate changes? We have a lessons register and an actions register. And We've just got to the... Uh, we're, we're coming to 12 months of using this post-event review management process. So these are just starting to get filled in, which is good because we're just being audited about uh, how well we've reacted to the previous review. So these things are extremely important uh, for the organisation's documentation. And this is a summary of this first presentation. The preparation before the event is our hazard outlooks. We use that during the event, structure and maintain our agility. We then go through a structured post-event review management process and the big benefit of all of this process is learning through the verification. Having PERM intimately aligned with the National Hazard Outlook allows us to assess each event and gather information, correct our biases, learn from the event and get better for the next forecast. The fact that PERM walked in the door at the same time that we were looking at developing a National Hazard Outlook, maybe it's coincidence, maybe it was fate, <laughs> but at has worked out beautifully from our point of view and this process and our national hazard outlook has been identified in many areas of the organisation as the way to structure the way we react to big events but also structure the way we work leading into events. Like I said, knowing where the impacts are is really useful to know where to put your, uh, your best resources and work uh, your best resources at the impacts. I'll finish that there. We've got... I'll, I'll just ask... Um, we'll probably do a couple of questions. The, uh, I'm, we're still getting through our heads the reschedule. I've got another presentation that I was thinking would be useful to get through and then have a coffee break rather than uh, pushing you know, through another couple of hours of PowerPoints, which might nearly kill you all. Uh, but the... So, so I'll go on to the next presentation, but is there anyone with a burning question right now uh, about that complete process?